It is good to see you this Sunday morning, since uh, most of you skipped church last week. So uh, glad you are here. Six years ago, a church was pursuing me to be their preacher, and I have to admit that their pursuit was flattering in many cases. It is rare that a church pursues a preacher, but often preachers will hunt for a church to hire them. When that occurred, I had to wonder about what God's will was for my life. Should I stay here, or should I entertain thoughts of moving to another congregation? After several weeks of email exchanges and phone calls, but no face-to-face -face contact, I'd made the decision to no longer consider the option the other church had put before me. Now, that was in November of 2012. In April of 2013, six months later, I walked in here and I saw some visitors at our early service, went over to them, introduced myself, asked where they were from, and they responded they were from Central Kentucky. And that is where the church was located that had been pursuing me, just south of Lexington, Kentucky. A few minutes later, another couple walked in I did not recognize. We had the exact same conversation. When the worship started, I looked over my wife and I said, there is a pulpit committee here today from that church in central Kentucky that I turned down six months ago. Now, after the service was over, those two couples exited immediately. I also told my son that morning, who was at that time working with our tech team, what, was, what I thought was going on. But in April of 2013, we had two morning worship services with Sunday school in between those. And at the beginning of the second worship service, the same scenario played out with two more couples, both telling me they were from central Kentucky. But then I noticed another visiting couple sitting over that direction. I walked over, introduced myself, and this time the man said, you and I have been emailing and talking for the last few months, and a few of us wanted to come and hear you preach and wanted to take you and your family to lunch and make you an offer. Dr. George Gilpin, who was a veterinarian and the chairman of the elders for Jessamine Christian Church in Nicholasville, Kentucky, took us to lunch and made us an offer for me to become their preacher. And we had to struggle with what was God's will concerning that offer. Is it a geographical area that we liked? It was still only two hours away from our parents, which is the distance we are here. And I am a huge UK basketball fan. They've got six victories in a row now. And to live just a few miles from Rupp Arena was very enticing to me. I I did counter their offer by telling them I would need season tickets for UK basketball. <laughs> Dr. Gilpin looked at me and he said, that is not a problem, you will have them. So I knew it was God's will to at least consider <laughs> making that move. Two weeks later, though, I phoned Dr. Gilpin and told him while flattered they would go to such an extent to consider me back then that I was going to remain here. But in November of last year, that congregation came open again and they have made a call to a preacher to come and be the preacher at Jessamine Christian Church because the preacher that went there six years ago has retired and they have been doing a search for a replacement. So I need to announce to you today uh, that they have called some guy named Lee Faust out of Virginia and they did not give me a call, an email, or anything on this search. So if you've been praying, Lord, may your will be done and we get a new preacher, I'm disappointing you today about what God's will is. For the growing Christian, the desire to follow God's will for your life should be the ultimate goal you have in every decision you're going to make. In some situations, it's going to be easier to know God's will than others. But I'm guessing most of us in here have had questions for our lives. What does God want me to do? Who should I marry? Should I accept a new job offer? Am I to accept a leadership role in the church? Should I confront the problem in our extended family, or should I just hope it goes away? I sometimes wonder why some Christians do not earnestly seek God's will for their future, since ultimately he controls it. I think God desires that each of his children reach the maximum potential for our lives and the maximum spiritual potential is where he wants us. We all have critical decisions to make at various junctures, college, career, dating, marriage, children. Do we move or change jobs? Do we invest money? Do we retire? Now, there are two misconceptions about God's will that are very common today. One is God has every detail of your life prearranged. A misconception is that God has every single detail of your life Prearranged. This sermon series is entitled Spiritual Boot Camp, Basic Training. John Globleck of our church was in the army, and he shared with me, the drill instructors will use your everyday life to teach you things in a way where you're forced to do it the army way. This is to so you depend on their leadership to get you through. I think of Moses. No matter what you do, you can't go against them, or you will eventually 
pay the price. Now, if God prearranged every detail of our lives, we would not need to ever seek his will. We would never need to worry about what was coming next. But I think we have to acknowledge two things, the sovereignty of God, but we also have to acknowledge our own personal free will. Now, in some cases, God has no preference about our choices because any choice is good. It can help grow us spiritually. I can go home two different ways where I live. I can either make a ride on Corliss Drive or I can go on down to the next traffic light and make a ride on Oxford. Oxford Drive, but I'm going to reach the same destination. So I think God, following God's will, is often more like a compass that is guiding us instead of a single road map with that there's only one direct path. Now the second misconception about God's will is that God's will is always unpleasant. There is a certain fear I think that some Christians have about understanding completely to God's will or surrendering completely to God's will is simply going to make them miserable because God might send them to work in a third world country as a missionary. God might ask them to give away all their money. God may have this single guy who's very handsome marry this homely looking person instead of this gorgeous knockout. Probably 20 years ago, I was teaching our senior high class one Sunday, and we got to talking about dating and male-female relationships, and we listed qualities that people would want to see in a potential mate for life. All of the guys in that senior high class listed as the number one thing they wanted to see in a mate was physical appearance, that they wanted that to be the first quality. I said something to the effect, well, beauty is only skin deep. Faith lasts. Beauty does not. And one of the guys said, but Mr. Snotty, you can convert a pretty girl, but you can't make an ugly Christian pretty. <laughs> I didn't have an answer for that one. I, I couldn't respond. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, it's not following God's will that'll make you miserable. It is disobedience to God that'll make you miserable. Knowing that you are outside of God's will and that eventually there will be negative consequences even to the point of losing your eternity with God. So I want us to look at some well-known verses and how we can determine to know God's will for our lives today. Now these verses, just two of them, out of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And in those two verses, I see a promise, a precaution, and a procedure for knowing God's will for our lives on this earth. First, notice the promise. The New International Version reads, He will make your path straight. The King, Ver King James Version reads, He shall direct your paths. The message paraphrase reads, He's the one who will keep you on track. But in this promise of directing our paths, God does not reveal exactly where you are going. In this promise of directing our paths, God does not reveal exactly where you are going. Ultimately, God can lead us to heaven, but he does not always tell us where he's taking our lives on this earth. I was making a visit two Sundays ago after church over at the James Cancer Center at OSU, and while I was walking to the patient's room, I began reflecting how early in my teen years, it had been my desire to be a medical doctor. From about the age of five or six, that was my dream. For 10 or 11 years, I wanted to go into medicine. Now, I think God would have been okay with my being a medical doctor instead of a preacher because physical healing is needed. But I'm not sure any of my patients would have been okay with my being a medical doctor. <laughs> James 4.13 says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, well, you don't even know what is going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And in this promise of directing our paths, God does not promise that his will is always easy to determine. There are times that God's will is very clear, and there are other times you have to work at determining God's will in your life. In Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul spent a, quite a bit of time going from one area to another, determining where his ministry was to go, but it took him time and effort. In Acts 16, verse 6, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So determining God's will for your life most likely is going to involve prayer, discussions with other Christians, opportunities that God is opening before you. 
Hebrews 10, 36 says, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you'll receive what he's promised. So determining God's will is not always easy. And in this promise of directing our paths, God does not promise his will is always smooth. God promises to direct our paths, but some paths can be rugged. Uh, some paths can be uphill. Uh, some paths require a lot more energy. In June of last year, our son and I went to Mount Washington, New Hampshire, and while you can drive almost all the way to the top, there's still several hundred feet you have to walk up to get to the summit. And so we climbed up and did the rocky, steep climb up to the summit of Mount Washington. But the day before, we had spent touring Montreal. Uh, we were a few hours north up in Montreal, and my son said, Dad, it's on a Friday night about 9 o'clock. He said, let's climb Mount Royale. Or Mount Royale in Montreal is it's just only about 1,000 feet, but the road to the path going up there is about four miles long. And I got about two-thirds of the way up, and I said, I can't go any further. My knees were given out. My legs were given out. Plus, we had to go down the hill, and from the base of the mountain, it was a four-mile walk back to our hotel. And so I told my son, I said, here, if you want to take my camera and go take pictures at sunset, you take it. I went down to the bottom of the hill, called a cab, rode it back to the hotel. I said, I am done with climbing this, this path. Adam called me and said, did you make it back to the hotel? I said, it was a strain, but I did okay. I got back. Now, when the Apostle Paul went to Macedonia, after finally determining a direction, the first thing that happened to him was he was thrown in jail. I had to think that, I have to think that while he's standing there in jail, he is thinking, God, I'm doing your will. What am I doing in jail? But it was in that jail where Paul and Silas were that suddenly an earthquake occurred and the jailer and his family were converted. Just because you walk in God's will does not mean you're going to be exempt from illnesses, financial setbacks, rejections, death, or car problems while you're traveling. We're only told that if we trust God, he'll direct our paths. He's saying, I have a plan so you can reach your maximum spiritual potential to glorify me. The problem is we often seek God's will based on what we think rather than what God desires. In 1925, this photo was taken of a New York City police officer stopping traffic for a cat with a kitten in her mouth trying to cross the street. The officer stopped traffic both directions and the cat ran across in five seconds. J. Wallace Hamilton, a popular preacher of the early 1900s, wrote of this incident, the cat did not understand the power of the New York City Police Department to hold up traffic to allow him to cross safely. There are times we are not aware that God's strong arm goes up to protect us, guide us, or introduce us to the right person or situation needed in our lives. God promises, I'll direct your paths. But there's also a huge precaution in these verses given by Solomon in this book of wisdom called Proverbs that we need to heed. Because it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But that's what we often do. We have a decision to make, and we count on our knowledge. You start planning regarding college, and you wonder about the best academic school. You wonder about the one that's closest to home. Maybe you wonder one about the farthest away from home. You wonder what school has the most attractive campus. You wonder what school has the most attractive girls, and you want to determine like that. And while all those may be influencing factors, have you wondered, will this help grow my faith? Can I survive at this college spiritually? The statistics are undeniable. Many Christian young adults cannot survive the onslaught of temptation and often the valueless education that is given. Maybe you're looking at a career change or changing your role within a company or relocating. We often lean on our own understanding. What will my hours be? How much will I get paid? Will it give me prestige in my field? Even in ministry, those very same questions are often asked. When that church called me six years ago, I told him, I said, I not only will need season tickets to the UK basketball games, I'll need at least a $10,000 raise. But the factor should be for the Christian, Lord, how can I honor you in this change? How can I honor you in this career? How will this move affect my spiritual life of my family? Where will we attend church? Will I ever have to compromise my convictions? Will I have to neglect my family with traveling? Sometimes we have an impulse to do something that seems right, and we realize later it was more than a coincidence. God may synchronize events and people in our lives. I often think that occurs in some very mundane ways. Rarely does it occur with great fanfare. A simple lunch or a dinner makes lifelong friends. An introduction to someone at church turns into a business partnership. But I think we have to be cautious. I don't think we can flippantly assume that every event or every new person we meet is automatically a synchronization by God. But on the other hand, we must not deny that God can arrange meetings and events in our lives to accomplish his will. 
Mary was about to give birth, and a decree was issued by Caesar Augustus that each family traveled to their hometown for a census and for taxing. Joseph and Mary suddenly ended up in Bethlehem, where it's prophesied that the Messiah would be born. Moses' mother placed him in a basket in the Nile, and along came Pharaoh's daughter to bathe. Ruth was gleaning in a field owned by Boaz, her kinsman redeemer. But I want to throw out another precaution here. Because most of us live, we live, we all live in a very prosperous nation, but most of us live fairly prosperous in our circumstances. And if not careful, we can minimize living in God's will to saying, I know I am because of the blessings that come to me materially. You see, in the Bible, Joseph and Mary were blessed to be the parents of the Son of God, but they were very poor economically. And sometimes we can have the misconception of God's will that if we're prospering personally, we must be living within the will of God as a Christian. But there's also another entity. You can also be living right in the middle of Satan's will. King Hezekiah of the Old Testament is a very prime example of this truth. In 2 Kings chapter 20, Hezekiah contracts a life-threatening illness. So the prophet Isaiah told Hezekiah to get ready to die. Now naturally, Hezekiah is devastated by the news. He wept morbidly. He begged God to give him an extension on his life. And God honors Hezekiah's very bold prayer by giving him another 15 years. And while his physical body improves, his spiritual health declined. When the king of Babylon heard about Hezekiah's miraculous recovery, he sends some men over to King Hezekiah to congratulate him on the healing. But instead of giving glory to God, what Hezekiah does is he shows off all the treasures he's accumulated over his life, and he suddenly has taken God's favor in his life and twisted it into an opportunity to display his own pride. But it gets worse. When the Babylonians leave, Isaiah informs Hezekiah how that his pride is going to have devastating consequences. All of his earthly treasures are one day going to be ransacked. His own sons are going to be taken away. They're going to be forced to live in Babylonian exile. And you know how Hezekiah responds to all of this he says why not if there'll be peace and security in my days who cares if it hurts them Hezekiah is saying as long as I'm getting what I want and I'm living how comfortably I want it's okay I'm not really caring as long as things go well that's all that matters to me you see Hezekiah passed the test of adversity he was hoping in God alone when he needed to be healed he was hoping in God alone when his army was outnumbered 20 to 1 by an opposing king named Sennacherib. And God sent an angel during the middle of the night in a battle and 185,000 of Sennacheribs were not dead. God had protected Hezekiah from defeat. He protected him from death. But Hezekiah failed the test of prosperity. And it is the one that most Christians fail. He shows us it's so easy to receive material blessings from God and then make them all about us. Hezekiah had another problem because in that 15 years of the extension that God added to his life, Hezekiah fathered a son. That son was named Manasseh. And Manasseh, if you look him up, he was the worst king ever in all of Israel and Judean history. And he reigned for 55 years, tearing God's people apart. God blesses us with life, with prosperity, with family, with salvation from sin, and we think it's about our comfort and our needs and our glory because when we're blessed materially, it is only through the will of God that we are to use it to bless other people. I've always heard God does not waste a hurt, but I think God doesn't waste a success either. It may not look like it, but often your prosperity is a test. Material prosperity is not to be used as a stockpile for self. It is to be used to direct others to the God whose grace led you where you are today. And so you can thwart God's will in your life. You can indulge self, you can indulge ego, and that's exactly what Hezekiah did. Randy Alcorn in his book, Money, Possessions, and Eternity, writes, A disciple of Jesus does not ask how much can I keep, but how much more can I give? Whenever we start to get comfortable with our living of giving, it's time to raise it again. You see, there's a huge difference between living in God's will and living within your own pride and your own ego. That's why Solomon says, lean not on your own understanding. It's been said most believers have never found the secret of discovering God's will. They're too caught up on their search for their own will. It is difficult to grow your faith inside your comfort zone. Notice a procedure here. Now, there is not a prescribed procedure specifically outlined in Scripture to determine God's will for every decision in your life, but there are some principles. It begins with the very first phrase of our text. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. 
And so walking in God's will requires a singleness of allegiance. If you're married and you want to be the best marriage, you can't have another person to whom you show that kind of affection and attention. Guys, let's say you and your wife decide that next Sunday evening you're going to eat at Buffalo Wild Wings. Your wife wants to spend time with you, talk to you for a couple of hours, and you're looking forward to it. But on the way there, you realize, wait, this is the night of the Super Bowl. Wild Wings has big TVs. This is wonderful. You get to watch the game. It's great. You arrive, you order your meal. The game starts the same time your wife is wanting to have the conversation. And you're trying to listen to your wife at the same time as you're watching and listening to the game. And you're trying to listen to two totally different things going on around you, two different voices. And as a result, you don't get the best of both worlds, and you can't enjoy either to the maximum. You know, we do that with God's will in our lives. We say we want God's will for our lives, but then we seek our own understanding. And so we walk as Christians sometimes with one foot on God's path, one foot on our path, and eventually we're going to do a split. And many Christians saturate themselves with the things of the world, but spiritual items such as church and Bible reading and prayer and counsel from strong Christian friends is minimized, and they wonder why they can't seem to understand God's will for their lives. It's because they're not listening to the right voices. And in trying to follow two paths, they can't get the best of God's. So Solomon says, you trust in the Lord with all your heart. So here are several suggestions for determining God's will in your life for individual decisions, especially if they're difficult. Now, these suggestions I'm going to list primarily come from a book entitled Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness by Brian Jones. Brian Jones' parents are members of this church, and his sister and brother-in-law are members here as well. I'll tell you more about Brian in a moment. Here's the first suggestion. Look to Scripture first. If you're going to follow God's will and use principles to follow it, look to Scripture first. Everything you want to know about what God thinks about life and loving and living is contained in Scripture. Almost every situation that you could ever possibly face in life when needing direction, the counsel can be gained from following a principle that is found in the Bible. Do I hang in there when the marriage is tough? Yes, because God hates divorce, the Bible says. Do I look for ways to get even when I've been hurt? No, it's God's place to handle revenge not yours. And God never contradicts his word. And the Holy Spirit never contradicts the word of God either. So a Christian cannot come up to you or you cannot come up to me and say, listen, I believe this is the will of God because the Holy Spirit prodded me this direction and it be directly opposite the word of God. Because the Holy Spirit cannot, the word of God cannot go where the spirit of God has not been. And the spirit of God is dependent upon the word of God to operate. So you cannot, be, you cannot say that God has told you to do something when it is directly against Scripture. That is why it is so important as a fundamental basic in this series. We've been talking about basic training. And the first sermon three weeks ago was about putting ourselves in the Word of God daily. So the Word of God should help to develop your perspective on various issues. The Word of God should help to give you a worldview. Just because certain laws are enacted, such as an outrageous one regarding abortion in the state of New York this past Tuesday, does not mean as Christians we cower down and accept it. Because the will of God is rather firm on the creation and the conception of life if you look to Scripture first. Abortion is wrong, period. And so as a result, we stand on life and that life begins at conception. And as a church, we support Heartbeats of Licking County I would encourage you in light of that law that was passed in New York to give additional funds to Heartbeats this week. Give $10 for each person in your house representing that you believe first in Scripture and that it validates life beginning at conception. Psalm 139, 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. As you leave today, if you didn't get one already coming in, there is a bookmark entitled How to Meditate on God's Word. The next step in determining God's will for your life is determine if the opportunity is being forced by you. Determine if the opportunity is being forced by you. In other words, are doors opening for something to occur? It may be a job change. It might be about relocating. It might be about an opportunity for serving. If you sense there are some opportunities, you investigate further. You make calls. You ask questions. You send resumes. You watch for indicators that there is an opportunity being placed in your path. One of the ladies in our church emailed me earlier this past week indicating that she is seeking God's will in a career change and asked for prayer, wanting to know, 
is where I've been working for the last 30 years, is that's where I'm supposed to remain or am I to seek a change of career? On December the 18th, I received an email from Brian Jones. Now, I had sensed I'm getting a bit stale in my own personal ministry, and when that occurs, I often need a new challenge. Brian's email read, Dear Paul, I know you're knee-deep in Christmas prep, but I have a huge favor to ask. I wanted to know if you'd pray about going with me on a vision trip to Panama City, Panama on February 25th through 28th, 2019. I'd like you to help organize a new church planning movement in Panama City. Over the last five years, I've become close to an amazing church planner named Jose Rodriguez. He's led a huge church planning movement in El Salvador. He now has a passion to move back to his home country of Panama and start a new church in Panama City. That church would then launch 10 new church plants in all 10 provinces throughout the country. Other than a quick trip this past fall to shoot some videos about the need, nothing else has happened yet. We don't know where in Panama City. We're not sure about the specific strategy. We'd love your help on deciding this. Jose would like, if this is an opportunity to take, to move next August and launch the church Christmas of 2019. I'm praying for eight to ten ministers interested in getting on the ground floor of this and become the team that would make this effort happen. This is a ton of fun, and I believe it's right up your alley. Are you interested? So for the next week, I just kept that email to myself. I didn't speak to anyone about it, not even my wife. And then I started putting out some feelers. I asked my wife, what do you think I ought to do? She said, well, I think you ought to go, you ought to go if you want. Go check it out. I asked a close couple of Christian friends who I know are sensitive to how God to work in people's lives. And they said, you ought to go. I talked with Matt Hayden, our minister of discipleship and outreach one day, about our missions budget and how ultimately our ultimate goal is that 50% of the money we give away out of this church goes to help start new congregations. Because we know that uh, new congregations win more people to Jesus Christ in their first three to five years of existence than any established church does. Plus, the other thing is we support that church for three to five years and we take those same funds and we can move them to another new church plant and we can multiply the kingdom of God over and over. Right now, now we're at 12.5% going to new church works out of our missions budget. So that amount in the next three to four year needs to be quadrupled. So Tri-Village is supporting two new church works right now in the United States, one south of Boston up in Massachusetts at Quincy. We just sent a youth group up there a couple of years ago. We support another one in Providence, Rhode Island, and we give to Stadia, which is a church planting organization. But this potential church in plant in Panama City, Panama, would be through Lifeline Christian Mission, with whom we already have a wonderful relationship and a deep connection. So I took it to our elders at our last meeting, which was earlier this month, and they were supportive. So in four weeks, I'm going to Panama City for four days and spending time there with several other ministers as we try to determine God's will, his leading for this potential endeavor. Charles Swindoll writes, when God's in it, it flows. When the flesh is in it, it is forced. You know, opportunities can come in many forms, and not all of them are from God. It's not always determining, easy determining the origin. So that leads me to this principle. Realize that patience, and sometimes even suffering, is part of the process. Realize that patience, and sometimes even suffering, is part of the process. Oh, didn't you just say, when God is in it, it flows, and when the flesh is in it, it is forced? I think we're often tempted to ask God for a sign, when all we're really trying to do is force God's hand in a matter. You cannot sidestep the wisdom-building process of trials and tribulations that God has taken you through. Remember what I said earlier? God never wastes a hurt. There are some of you who can look back on your spiritual journey, and you can see where God has matured you through some of those difficult times to make a more difficult decision even later. So discerning God's will is not always miraculous. Sometimes there's a lot of time involved. There is patience. There is suffering. The guy lived in a low-lying area, and it started flooding, and the guy had no transportation. A National Guard jeep pulled up to his house, so offered to take him away from there, and he declined, saying, no, I believe the Lord will take care of me. About four hours later, the man's still sitting on his front porch, and there's water swirling around his feet, and a boat pulls up, and a guy in the boat says, hop in, and we'll get you out of here. And the man said, no, I don't believe I'll do that. I believe God will take care of me. About three hours later, the man is sitting on his rooftop, and a helicopter flies over, and he drops, the helicopter drops a harness, and the pilot says, get in this harness, and we'll fly you out of here. And the man declined, no, I believe the Lord will take care of me. And the man drowned. He went to heaven complaining to the Lord and said, why in the world didn't you save me? God said, I sent a jeep, a boat, and a helicopter. What in the world do you want? <laughs> Discerning God's will is not always miraculous. There is no excuse for a Christian to be an airhead. 
God provides us with minds to use in common sense. Sometimes that's learned through suffering and heartaches, and you learn not to make a certain decision again. But determining God's will may take time. If a decision needs to be fast-tracked, it's possible you need to slow down and you need to wait. God never hurries, but he's never late. I love what the Bible says in Isaiah, those that wait upon the Lord are going to be the ones who renew their strength. A man asked the Lord, is it true with you a thousand years are like one second? And he said, yes, it's true. The guy said, is it true with you a million dollars is like a penny? He said, yes, it is. The guy said, could I have a million dollars? God said, wait a second. <laughs> Determining God's will may mean suffering. It may mean assessing the situation. Cowboy came out of a saloon and saw that somebody painted his horse's tail a bright red, and he was furious, and he said, Who did this? I will tear them limb by limb. The guys outside doubled over in laughter, and they said, Oh, well, the big guy in the hardware store over there did it. And the, the cowboy stormed into the hardware store, and he said, Who painted my horse's tail red? And a blacksmith about seven foot tall, chiseled like stone, walked out, and he said, I did. What are you going to do about it? Cowboy said, Looks like to me the first coat's about dry, and the horse is ready for a second coat. <laughs> God seldom expects us to do absurd things, although he may ask us to take risk and depend on him. Where do you need to take a risk in your faith today? Where is it God's will is you need to step out of your comfort zone today, and you need to take a risk. One other principle, seek wise counsel from other Christians. Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. There is often value in group judgment. You seek those friends who are committed and mature Christians, who have experience in life, who are willing to be open and honest with you. You do not inquire of somebody you work with who has no spiritual vitality whatsoever because they're going to lead you on a path that is not God's path. Even Christian friends, though, are not an infallible source, but they can give potential guidance. What if you later discover you've made a wrong decision or you've made a bad decision? Remember Moses in the Old Testament? He was placed in a basket that floated him down as an infant into the Nile right into the hand of Pharaoh's daughter. She raised him as her own son, meaning Moses was basically the grandson to the Pharaoh. I think Moses was also heir apparent to the throne of becoming Pharaoh. But Moses did something outside of God's will. In his anger, he murdered an Egyptian taskmaster. And he had to run and hide for his life for 40 years. So he got off the path, but eventually God brought him back. And if you've made a decision, God can, with his power and your willingness to yield to him, get you back on the right path. Now, it may take time. It may cost you some heartache. It may cost you some finances. <clears throat> it may require a few extra steps in your life, but he often can open those doors. In 1989, I made a bad decision about going to church in northeastern Pennsylvania, and six months into it, I knew it was the wrong decision, and Barb and I began praying about what to do. I even told Barb that on this Monday in July, so six months, July was the sixth month we'd been there, that if nothing came open by December, six months later, I was going to leave ministry, and I would seek another vocation. And that was on a Monday night, and it was that very night I got a call from a man named Bill Hayes here in Patasco, Ohio, from this church asking if I would consider coming here. And the doors opened. But it was not without some patience, a lot of prayer, and difficulties through that previous ministry. God's will was that Jesus would go to the cross, and it included suffering. But Jesus knew his path included a way to the cross, even in spite of suffering. So when we participate in communion, it is a time to celebrate Jesus following his Father's will, and it's a time for us to reflect, asking if we are doing the same. Because you say, well, I'm going through suffering. I don't know if I'm in God's will. It may be exactly where God wants you right now. And just because you're living prosperous does not mean you're in the will of God. You very well may be living in the will of Satan. As communion is being distributed this morning, we're asking today if you're a follower of Jesus Christ to partake, and we're asking you to partake as it is being distributed. So you can take of the bread and take of the cup, and then you can return it to the tray or to the holder under a chair in front of you, or you can dispose of it as you leave. But we'd ask that you partake, and there'll be some music playing, so you can have time to reflect, am I following 
the will of God. God's will in the Bible also includes that no person should perish. In fact, it says that every person would come to repentance and know Jesus Christ. When the service is dismissed after our time of communion and some more time of worship, you can come to the front and meet me up here near these steps. And we can talk about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sometimes it is difficult to discern your will. And sometimes it is very easy. But we know that one of the easy parts of discerning your will is to take these moments and to reflect on what Jesus did in being obedient to your will, in becoming our perfect Savior and perfect sacrifice. So God, as we have a few moments today to reflect on what that means, and if we're following in your will, I would pray that you give nudges where they're needed. I would pray that you would give suffering where it's needed, if it means getting a follower back on track. There's nothing more greater to know that we can live in your will. And then when we leave this world, we can be in your presence forever. In Jesus' name, amen.